Okay. There we go. And I will hand over to Jose. Take it away. Okay. So um, I'm not just going to be putting um, a link to Mentimeter if you want to do it. Otherwise, I will share my screen anyway. And at the top of the screen, you should be able to see a Menti um, link. So if you go to menti.com and you use that code on the top right, that will give you access to this thing. And just to start, I mean, we're talking um, today, we're going to be talking about metrics and estimation and how do we do it, different ways of doing it. So I will invite you to think for a minute very quickly about how do you, how does your current estimation technique work for you? Um, so I'm going to give you just, just a, a few seconds, um, hopefully enough time for some of you to log in and to get it there. But okay, so we're seeing there kind of works, most majority of us, um, but not, not awesome, often it's about 10% of us and a few of them that it doesn't really work. Okay, so in this session, we're going to be talking about estimation um, quite a bit and how we can hopefully do better estimation. What I am not going to be doing is telling people um, bad estimation, don't use these techniques, good estimation, use these ones. I don't know your context. I don't know how you're using your things. So there is no, it's, it would be inappropriate to say, this is bad, this is good. Yeah. What I like to go is to, to talk about why we do estimation, perhaps how we are doing the estimation, how can we do it better, and suggest some things that I tend to use in my own work. Okay, but without saying good or bad or things like that. So if if we take that feedback, I mean, it's like about 90% of us, either it doesn't work or kind of works. Okay, what I would like to then do in the next step is, okay, given your, your answer is, which one of, which estimation techniques do you use? And you can choose more than one of that list. I'm putting a few examples, which are the most popular, story points, t-shirt sizes, flow metrics, function points, no estimates, person days. Um, and you will see like it, it's going to correlate to your answers as well. So all the ones in red, it's um, the techniques that you use for people that say that it's awesome. If it's blue, the techniques that you're using for people that don't really work. So let's see which ones are the most popular ones. Got a good range in there. Story points are sort of like leading the pack. A bit of t-shirt size is there as well, fairly popular, flow metrics and estimates, person days, and no one using function points. That makes me happy. Um, I've run this in many different groups, and actually, sometimes cultural context matters. For example, I was doing this talk for, for uh, in a conference recently in Israel, and um, in the Israeli market, a lot of people are still using person days. So that was a bit of a surprise to me, but culturally they are, they still do person days. And he was like, fine, okay, but that's, that's the thing that you're using. Um, but yeah, here we see that in, in order of popularity, story points, t-shirt sizes, no estimates, flow metrics. So that's good. Um, so as I say, we, we're going to be talking about estimations. Um, techniques, practices, why do we estimate and go that. If anybody gets the background of the of the title, it gets geeky points. Um, um, I call it all your story points that belong to us. And the inspiration for this was this this picture. Anybody recognizes that? If you do, do a thumbs up or a heart in the in the in the feedback. Um, this is a, a game that was very, very, very popular in the oh what it was in late 80s, early 90s. Um, and what happened in here, what you have is like something called lost in translation. Yeah, it was very, very, very popular, created in Japan. And when it got translated to English, the translation didn't, didn't make any sense. What the intent was, was to say, hey, we've, con we've conquered all your bases. Yeah, you lost. But the translation that the, the, the people did was all your base are belong to us. Okay. And I think that many times what happens in the estimation world is we are suffering from this. We are suffering a little bit from 
from lost in translation, we sometimes we forgot the intent, we forgot what we're aiming to do. Yeah. And and so that's not something that I would I would like to personally try to recapture a little bit more. Okay. So that's the that's the the why of the title. Now, in your own words, so I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds maximum. I would like you to think for a minute before I give you my answers. What's the purpose of estimating work? Why do we even estimate? So it's going to take a little bit of typing. Don't, don't do a huge long one. Yeah, when can it be done? Good. So let's see what the, what the, there's going to be a little bit of a delay while we get some answers. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to see what, what comes up. When can it be done is a great question. Or great definition. Predictability, love that. How much effort? Predictability again. For planning, absolutely. For long term planning, short term, long term. Teams to discuss complexity of a work item, love that. Understand non complexity. And there's also other things, but great delivery time, priority to prioritize, select things. Is it worth doing it? Love that. Uh, you have uh, to predict how much work we can finish within the sprint. If you're using a sprint, absolutely. Have a conversation to make sure the team all understand it. I, I love all those all those things. Okay, so great answers. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you my answers, but it I think it's quite important that before we do this to make a distinctions because it really there are two kinds of estimation. Okay. One of them is to estimate what we call single item estimator. estimation. Is to say, you know, I've got a piece of work. How, you know, how long will this take? Yeah. And the other one is multiple item estimator, estimation. I have a bunch of work. How long will that take? Or how much it will take? And so on. So we're going to explore each one of those types because they are different. And how we do that is going to be different. So, if you're happy with that, I'm going to start with single item estimation. And for me, the sole purpose of estimating work, single items of work, is to answer two questions. Question number one, can we do this work in the time allocated to it? Yeah, if it's in Scrum and Sprints, is can we do this inside the Sprint? If you're using, if, you're, if you have been given a deadline, can we do it by the deadline? If you have like I don't know, some sort of like um, service level expectations, can it be done within those service level expectation? Yeah. So basically, does this fit? Is it, it is it small enough? Can we do it within that that time allocated to it? That's question number one. Yeah. Question number two. Do we understand it well enough to start working on it? As I say, don't we understand it perfectly? Is do we understand it well enough to go for it? Of course, we will figure things out. You know, we're working in a complex domain, knowledge work. We are not going to know everything. It's, there is a discovery process. There is a creative learning process. Yeah, but we have to feel confident enough as a team that we understand. What we're doing, what we're doing, and that there is that we can do it within a certain particular amount of time allocated to it. Okay, with that. So, when people say like we're talking about story points and planning podcasts, and people say like it's about the conversation. Ah, yes, it is. That's the second part of the question. Yeah, the conversation should be, do we understand it? Actually, it's also the first part of the question. It's like yeah, we feel confident that we can do it. Yeah. So if that's the case, if you look at these two questions, there are really, really only three possible answers. Answer number one, the successful one, is yes, this is small enough to be done in the time allocated to it. And yes, we understand it well enough to start working for it. Yeah. So in that case, bring it on. Whenever you're ready for it, Go for it. You know, if you're doing a sprint planning, put it in your sprint backlog. If you're doing some sort of like selection process in Kanban, bring it on. You know, use it. Um, if you're doing in whatever context, whatever setup you're doing, um, it's ready. Good. 
Um, if you're familiar with the Lunar Logic uh, cards, they are awesome. You know what's going to come next. Um, the, this is the yes, yes. Go for it. Now we're going to go into the no's. Another possible answer, second answer is no, it's too big. Yeah, you know what the F in the middle is. I'm not going to say. Okay, so no, it's too large. It's too large to the time allocated to it. Therefore, we need to break it down. We need to figure out how to break it down. So that whatever those sub components or sub sub stories or sub sub elements are going to fit. Okay. And the third one is, no, we don't understand it well enough. Yeah, the car is no clue, NC. Yeah, so if you don't understand it well enough, we need to refine it further. We're not ready. We have too much uncertainty to even get it started. Cool? So that gives us three answers. Yes. It fits, it's small enough, and we understand it, so we go for it. No, it's too big, so we're going to break it down. No, we don't understand it, so we're going to refine it further. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So what happens many times is that when, we, when we're trying to do this, these conversations, yeah, most of the teams, that's all they, need to, they will need to do. It's just whether it's one of those three options. We really don't need to do more. This is probably a personal opinion, but we don't need to do more than that. What we end up doing is when we start bringing things like planning poker or this kind of like Fibonacci style of precision, this is adding a sense of precision, which can actually be a distraction. All those possible options, one, two, three, five, eight, are just different ways of saying, yeah, we believe that we can do it in the sprint. Or no, it's too big. Yeah. So many times I think and I've seen that we end up paying more attention about whether it's a five of an eight or an eight rather than the actual original intent and purpose of the estimation technique was. Yeah. I think that many times this can be a distraction to the actual purpose of the process or of the, of the, of the technique of estimation of estimating. Okay. So when you end up with it and, and, and it becomes complex, it becomes difficult. I mean, what many times have been teams that say, oh yeah, we are doing, you know, three or five, but we forgot what three meant or five meant. And we start forgetting what is the relative estimation. And people say, oh, I don't remember what the previous story was. Or we end up inventing all sorts of like visual presentations to do affinity mapping of estimation and things like that. All those things are, in some ways, we have overcomplicated by creating too many options, and now we are trying to devise new stuff to try to deal with that. Keep it simple. Remember, I don't talk about simplicity is the art of the work not done. Yeah. So, um, and and what ends up as a result is that despite all the good intentions that story point brought, yeah, what I end I, what I think sometimes end up happening is that it almost becomes a bit of an act of business theater. Yeah, where we pretend to answer those two questions, we actually probably forget that we are asking those questions, and that we are answering those questions. And instead, what we are doing is all this, all these ceremonial routines of like, you know, stuff. It can work really well, but keep the purpose in mind. Why are we doing this? Yeah. Are we trying to answer those two questions? Cool. So I've spoken for a little while. What I'm going to ask you now you to do is that was in, in this thing, what, what I'm trying to lead is that sometimes things that were done with great intentions can be either used as they were intended, or they can be abused. And we forget why we do these things. Yeah. And even the people that were at the beginning of Agile, the people that invented the story points and popularized the story points, have actually almost said they regret having done so. Yeah, because because how they are being abused. So I'm going to give you some examples of what is um, whether things are good use or abuse. Um, you got a whole list there. Um, I think there are six of them, and you can choose whether you think they are good use or abuse for each one of them. What are the six of them? Jira story points with decimal points. Some innovation that happened last year. 
What a feature. Normalized story points across multiple teams, because of course we want to compare performance across multiple teams. So we normalize the story points. The other one, ever increasing velocity. Give me more, you know, be more performant. Billing on the story points delivered. We're agile. Use the story points to assess a team's performance. And the last one, reduce ticket size to increase velocity. Your choices, are these good use or abuse of things that we do in the agile world? I'm gonna give you a few seconds to decide what you're gonna be doing. I think there is, there is a, a trend towards the right, towards the abuse. I'm going to give you one or two more. Looks like no one is a fan of Jira story points with decimal points. I mean, look about the, the level of precision. This story is at 8.37. Awesome. Awesome abuse. Yes. OK, so we got quite a few answers there. Um, you're saying that most of them are abuse. Um, I think that my my gut feel is the same. Yeah, that this is these are things practices that you see many times in business, which I will consider probably misuse of what the intent was or the purpose. The only one that I will have a bit of doubt is the the last one at the bottom. Yeah, because I think if we get re reduced ticket size, yeah, that's not that's generally not a good not not, not a bad thing. Yeah, to a point, but you know. Smaller tickets give us better feedback loops. That's awesome. To increase velocity, eh, that's really, we'll talk about velocity later. Maybe I don't care that much. But um, if you are getting reduced ticket sizes, that could be a really good thing. To the point, sometimes we go too far and we make it stories too small to actually deliver any value. Yeah. Um, so, but that's a different talk. All right. So, yes, most of these things are going to be abused. Okay, so question for you. I'm going to make a statement here. Tell me whether you think is true or false, what you believe true or false. The story points must correlate to time. Must the story points correlate to time? A few more seconds. Okay. Okay, the jury is there, is out. So about seventy percent of you think that is false. Five percent of you think that it's true. Okay, it's changed a little bit. Sixty, no, seventy percent. Yes, exactly. All right. Um, the keyword here is must. Yeah, but I'm gonna say maybe something that is potentially uncomfortable or controversial, but it is. If a story points don't correlate to time, what's the point of doing a story point? In the physical world, time is one of those physical parameters that matters. Remember the, one of the two questions of estimation. Do we, do we have, can we do it in the time allocated, about, allocated to it? Can we do it in the sprint? The sprint is about time. Your SLE is about time. The deadline is about time. Yeah. So story points might be a good a good abstraction if you want to use them, but in the end of the day, it has to translate to something in the physical world, and it is time. So maybe must is the is the 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 thing that said you to say false. Yeah. Um. But there has to de definitely be some element of correlation. If not, using story points may not be working for you as well as it should in, to answer that question. Yeah? And I'm not trying to say it's right or wrong, but I think that some correlation should be visible. Yeah? Um, so I'm going to explain why. I'm going to explain why, in, why I say that for me this is true. Yeah? Um, now, if I show you this graph on, on, the, on the vertical axis, 
we're going to have a story points. And, you know, we do this called like pseudo Fibonacci um, that we had before. Instead of 21, we use 20. All right. So if there has to be a correlation to time on the horizontal, I'm going to put a lapse time. Yeah. And this is um, the graph that I'm going to be showing you is sort of like fictional for um, explanation purposes. So, yeah. Um, so if there is a correlation, what you will expect is that as the story points are increasing, yeah, that should translate to an increase in the time it takes to do things. Because they are more complex, because there is more effort, because all those things that you take into account to decide that something is between five and eight. Yeah, there has to be there has to be the 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 what the story delivers or what it takes to deliver the story has to be a a significant difference yeah and that should translate to time okay so if you have a perfect correlation yeah you will have something like this and again i used for simplicity that every story point translates to doubling the time in this case yeah in the real world it will be different for you yeah so, but if it was a perfect correlation, yeah, every story that has five story points will end up with eight days, will be done in eight days. And everyone, every story that will finish with eight story, that will be cataloged or, or, or categorized as an eight story point will end up in 16 days. That would be the perfect correlation. The world is complex. We know that that's not going to happen. Okay. So we know that there's going to be some variability. Of course, there is. We said, you know, we will not know this. We will not know the story perfectly. We will know an approximation of it. We will know enough to get going. So that discovery process will create some, you know, variance. Yeah. But even with that variance, that story, that the, each story point will, you will still see a a, a kind of a pattern of that. That, if I was going to do the figure, would look more like, you know, when we draw uh, hurricanes. The hurricanes, as, as further in the future, they, they become wider and wider. There is more margin of error. There is more uncertainty. And you could imagine that the story of two points will have less uncertainty than a story of 13, which have a lot more uncertainty. Okay? And potentially, they could overlap a little bit. There will be an element of overlap. But you will have a sense of correlation. Okay, when this has been measured, when this has been looked at, um, people like Larry Maccheroni, about ten years ago, he 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 was working for who was the name of the company now, Rally Software, and he was given access to data from like that normalized data, so anonymized data, um, for about uh, I think it was about ten thousand teams, yeah, um, and. Since then, people like um, Mattia Battiston and Chris Young, I think in their book, have written about this as well. They have evidence. I have worked with teams where we had like data from from like 7,000 7, data points, and we've looked at this. And what we see many times is something like this, where there is practically no discernible difference in the actual elapsed time, the actual time it takes to do a story you can practically see no difference between what the story point size was and what the actual elapsed time was. You could have the stories of eight points that take practically no time, say three or four days, and the stories of one point that could take, you know, 20, 30 days. So if you have something like this, your story point technique is working. Keep going. Happy days. Yeah. If it looks like this, if you were to plot this two, and it looks like this, that story point it's not a useful. It's not working for you as a predictor of how much, how long it will take you to do it. And if it doesn't work, then you cannot do multiple story estimation. You cannot calculate for sprints. You cannot use this for sprints or, or, or um, 
or releases or you know the next delivery cycle whatever it is okay this this is actually this is these story points are um basically random feedback okay so which one of you which ones do you have no the question that i will have for you is do you actually check that your estimates correlate to elapsed time and the question would be yes and the, the answers would be yes and they more or less correlate yes and they show no correlation and no we don't check Okay, I think we're getting a very significant trend. Yeah. Um, if you're not checking, I will say please do, because it, it will help us be more impactful in why you're doing that. We're using those techniques, whatever techniques you're using. If you say yes, you check and they show no correlation, I will encourage you to say what experiments could you run, what alternatives could you run that will help you have more correlation. So how could you improve that practice, whatever you're using. And if, if yes, and they show more or less correlation, great. Can you get even better? Whatever you're doing well, how can you get even better? Cool. So um, this has been a lot about story points. What do we use? What do what do we use in you know, in Actinio, in our coaches and so on? Uh, those that know you know me, and you know that I'm a big fan of things like Kanban and Flow. I don't I, I like a Scrum as well. You know you can use these these things in Scrum. I use Flow metrics. Yeah, and the flow metric in particular that we try we use is um, cycle time. Yeah, um, why? Because flow metrics often give us a much more reliable reflection of what it takes. Flow metric cycle time in particular is about elapsed time, and it's elapsed time of the work that we have done before. Yeah, and if you are working in a consistent environment. If you have a team that is relatively consistent and the type of work that you have is relatively consistent and basically your environmental constraints are more or less consistent, the data that you have from the past, probably it's good to reflect what might happen in the future. So what we use is we use statistical forecasting with cycle time. We use what we've done before in order to forecast the future. Um, and that has one advantage is that remember when I show you this card and we wanted to estimate this card, it's actually, you could argue that it's actually impossible to esti actively estimate this card because this card, whatever this card is, doesn't matter, yeah? This card requires a learning, a creative process. You have never developed this card before. If you had developed this card before, you will be copy and pasting or you will be reusing probably. Yeah, so it will be pretty much it's done because you haven't done it before. There is an element of uncertainty of something that you haven't done before. The more complex it is, the least able we are to estimate. So it's more reliable to say, forget about estimating this actively. I'm going to look at the past and use the past to say, well, typically it takes you about 10 days to do this. We produce a forecast with a certain level of confidence. It's a much more reliable way of doing it. So I have a preference towards using flow metrics and in this case cycle times instead of a story points. Okay, but I'm not saying story points are bad. Is hey check, look at the correlation, look at how well it's working for you. Cool. So that's for single story points for single item estimation. The next one is multiple item estimation. So um, in order to multiple item estimation, I have to be able to do single item estimation well. Yeah. And the key thing is like, you know, um, how are we going to then go and say, you know, we, how many, how much work can we do in this sprint? How much work can we do by a certain date? Um, or how long will it take us to do it? So when we do an estimation, um, it's what we're trying to do is to answer predictably answer two of two answers and I just said them so I'm going to make them explicit one of the questions is how much work can we do by a certain date the end of a sprint the release date the quarterly plan the annual whatever it is you're estimating is you have a date in the future how much can we do 
yeah and the other one is how long will it take us to complete a batch of work so hey we got a backlog of 100 items how long will it take you to do we got these 25 features to deliver how long will it take us to do when will this project be ready yeah you see the two questions, the two type of questions? One of them is about how much work can we do by a date? The other one is how long will it take to complete a batch of work, all right? And, you know, in order to do that, we're gonna be doing multiple item estimation. So I'm gonna give you a few examples. I would like to know which techniques do you use today? One of them will be velocity with the story points. The other technique that we use to uh, normally velocity with um, uh, the count of a story, a story is done burn up charts cfds community flow diagrams monte carlo simulations of throughput and gun charts let's see what answer you can use more than one you can select more than one at the moment we got um, popularity with monte carlo ah, velocity is waiting already okay different types of velocity burn up charts community flow diagrams Okay, I'm going to give a few more answers. So velocity with the story points is the most popular ones. Then velocity with the count of the stories done. Bernard Chance. Okay, so the other ones are, yeah, a good spread really. But if velocity probably is um, the most popular. Now, if you see that one that you selected the most is velocity with the story points. So by doing that, there is an assumption that your story point technique is working for you. Check. Yeah, check. Now, okay, so we are going to be looking at multiple estimation. It's the multiple item estimation. What is using is a calculation, which usually is in the type of some sort of count over some sort of over a period of time. Yeah, I'm going to give you three examples. That you're going to see so for example the story points per sprint what we normally call velocity is a type of multiple item estimation count story points over a period of time the sprint whatever the sprint length is yeah another example the number of product backlog items per sprint if you're using scrum yeah or the number of tickets per sprint um, that we also call it many times velocity. That's also a multiple item estimation technique. And if you are, for example, more in the Kanban flow metrics world, um, you're going to be having things like number of work items per day. Same thing, count over a period of time. All those are ways of doing multiple item estimation. Okay, and they are all equally valid. But what they assume is that you you have reliable data to work with or useful data to work with now there is one 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 major problem with uh, many times when we do this kind of estimation um and the major problem that i see and we know is that we use averages too often and averages in the complex world are very very dangerous Please, please, please don't use it. Why, why average is, uh, is, is dangerous? Because average is typically towards halfway, it's, it's a halfway selection, yeah? Um, so what we're basically saying is that when we use averages, we're doing a coin toss. I have about 50% chance of being right, but I also have 50% chance of being wrong. The average is typically around the median of the mode. They are not always in the same place, but they are gonna be close to each other. Yeah, so basically we're using a technique where I only have about half a chance to get it right. In terms of business risk, that is bonkers. No company, well, depends actually, I'm not gonna be absolute. I think no company will do it, but if you're in an environment where you can take up that amount of risk, awesome. The majority of companies that we work with, we cannot sustain that level of risk the when we get it right when we get it right only half of the time or i reverse it we get it wrong half of the time it's too dangerous yeah um and also averages are very weak to outliers 
Um, the typical example that we will have is like, look, um, there are right now in the talk, we are 34 of us connected. If one of those people is Bill Gates, hi Bill, on average, we are all billionaires. When Bill goes, on average, we all go back to be skinned. Yeah. So sometimes you have your, your average can be very, very influenced, influenced by outliers. And that can distort how we use averages. OK, um, what we tend to do instead is to use um, one, have less risk, estimate with more confidence. And when we use flow metrics, um, we use what we call um, Monte Carlo. Um, simulation. Monte Carlo is a statistical forecasting technique. Um, they're using throughput as the core flow metric. No, it's not trying to um, use things like is. We need to be good at the single item estimation. Yeah. So that that becomes reliable. But what really matters when we are doing um, multiple item estimation, when we're planning for a sprint, yeah, it's how much work can we do per unit of time. So in this photo that you have on the left, the top bar is showing us how many items are we finishing every day. So for example, we may on one day we're released, we're finishing two items, and I want one, the other one zero. Yeah. So what we do what we do is with Monte Carlo is we run tens of thousands of simulations of what could happen over the sprint period. If it's, your sprint is two weeks, we run what could happen over the next 15 days tens of thousands of times. And that gives you that graph in the middle. And with that graph in the middle, then we say, okay, how much risk do I want to take? And that's where we say, we usually go for something like 85 to 80, 85 to 95 percent confidence. And we will say, um, this one is, uh, this is the, the how long will it take me? So this is different. But what we typically will say is, hey, you know, I can safely pick 10 items. I am 95% confident that I can do 10 items. Yeah. Um, so pick the 10 more important ones, deliver them. If for any reason you run out of work before the end of a sprint, Scrum, for example, allows you to bring more work in the middle of a sprint. Yeah. So I will play safely in a way that matches the business tolerance to these kind of things, how much risk the, the, the business tolerates, and then under promise over deliver. Unlike what we tend to do many times is that we, we are not using good estimation techniques. We end up over promising, under delivering or struggling with the quality of what we do. We end up cutting corners. We end up mi missing, missing expectations, all those sort of, sort of things. Yeah. So again, we try to use four metrics as a way of doing more reliable way of predicting what the world looks like for us. Cool. So with that, we've covered user, um, user stories, story points, sorry, and velocity, the two key things that we use in estimation. Um, and because I'm a real good fan of um, Apple, I'm going to be my Steve Jobs. Yeah. I say and one more thing. I'm not announcing a new iPhone, but there is another flow metric, which is really, really, it's actually really awesome. And it's called the aging work in progress. Why this is awesome. Yeah. Um, and we most of us have never heard of it. I had not heard about it until about well, probably about four years ago. And at the beginning, I didn't even understand it. So um, it's absolutely awesome. Why? If you're using things like daily scrums, if you're using things where the team is getting together to say, hey, what decisions do we need to take? How do we win? How do we deliver? Yeah, it's it's absolutely transformative when we do this thing, when we do things like daily scrums and so on. Um, why is because it's allowing us to exceed, anticipate delivery problems before it's too late. Um, what you see in that picture on the left, every the few dots that you have in there are the work that is currently in progress, work that the team has started and not finished yet. Any dot that is sort of like in the green online zone, typically it's progressing well. Don't worry about it. It's going well. It's going fast enough. Yeah. 
But the red, the one that looks like it's in the red, that's starting to run too late, too slowly. So unless you pick the pace, it's likely to miss the delivery expectation that we have. And for team this for teams, this is incredibly empowering. Yeah, because we can make really, really good decisions with data backing up those decisions. We talk about self-organization and self-management. This is one of the most powerful way of getting that in place for teams. Um, so I think it's absolutely awesome. And it's probably the best kept secret in Agile. So if you're curious, I encourage you to, to have a look at that. Okay. So with those these things, yeah, to me, this is my own personal experience with using the flow metrics of cycle time for single item estimation, um, throughput for multiple item estimation, and then work in progress aging for what's going on right now. Um, what we end up is going back to the games, we can level up and defeat the estimation boss and actually being becoming the boss, a good boss, not a bad boss. So that's me. I want to say thank you. If you want to explore more, there is things about metrics and stuff like that. There is some great books um, like uh, Dan Bacanti's um, Action of Agile Metrics for Predictability. So um, I encourage you to, to research more and to validate how well things are working for you and look at ways of making things better for you as well. Yeah, that's me. Thank you very much. I think we will do questions. Awesome. All right. Feel free to post questions in chat or more than welcome, just unmute and just ask away. Thank you, Steph. Now I get, says like, if that was good. I get blushing. Any questions on chat or audio, you can unmute yourself. Any questions, any thoughts, your experiences. And um, remember, I'm not telling you that this is the right way. It's, you know, ways that work for us that we use regularly. Um, but compare and contrast, yeah, what you're doing. Esther, please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you. Esther, your audio is becoming too garbled, so I'm, I am not understanding any, anything. Yeah, I you? couldn't hear that either. It might be easier if you just type your question into chat. Yeah. Sorry about that, Esther. We just couldn't couldn't understand. While you're typing that, uh, I think there's a question by Ian. And the question is, like, we use those cards and the actionable agile. Is two whips too large for our normal size work? Um, Ian, would you like to elaborate that a little bit more? Yeah, so, so basically we've been using those cards and and initially from going from story points, we started using those cards with one week being a normal size work. So if it's yeah. anything, a week or less, it's a one. But one yes. finding is we, we end up now splitting our work down too much. And there's, mm -hmm. there's kind of questions inside that that I'll put it to the team is that don't don't estimate that as what I can do as an individual in a week or less. It's what yeah. we can do as a team. So it encourages that swarming, that that breaking stuff yeah. down and working together. But is one week generally maybe too tight? You mentioned that sometimes you can split work too much. Yeah. So there is a few things. That is a fabulous question. Thank you, Ian. Um, so um, I think there is a there is a couple of things and um, really interesting things there. Um, one of them is imagine that you're using. Uh, by the way, um, the the spring being too weak is becoming something like the default that people do. And sometimes it's like, why are we doing two weeks? Yeah. So question number one is like, the sprint has to be the, uh, the, le the smallest length, I will say, that still allows you to deliver something of value and learn and get the feedback loops. Yeah. In some contexts, two weeks is too small. In some contexts, two weeks is too small. So the, too much. Yeah. Too long. So do, let's not do two weeks just because no one, no one is saying that it has to be two weeks. Scrum says 30 days or less. Yeah, um, but uh, beyond that, now, what, one thing that is really interesting, and we enter, we enter a topic, all these things are things that we look in metrics, yeah, um, the concept of uh, right sizing. 
if your sprint says your sprint length is two weeks one mistake that we will have is to try to size every item to be two weeks because obviously as things spread as the as the time is not going to be perfect correlation yeah um you will start missing things so when we talk about right sizing is you have to do and you're not going to start every item exactly on the same time at the beginning of a sprint you're going to start them at different times so the size of each item has to be sufficiently small to be started and be reliably finished inside that sprint typical advice is that the for a two-week sprint the item size should be less of, less than a week some people say two three days why they are small enough to be started um, not all at the same time so you give the team opportunities to, to decide when they start yeah but also they are small enough that when those ones that we couldn't predict that are big happen you can still finish them and that's the concept of right sizing. There, there is, a, there is, a, there is a technique of how we do this. Is that all right, Ian? I, I, I don't know if I answered exactly the question. There was something else that was important in this, and I forgot. So um, it's okay. Good enough. Um, okay. So yes, I will say, I will say that you know, um, for a two-week sprint, try to make this, try to make the story, size the stories to to be a week or less. So you have that still that flexibility. Ah, the other thing is that what happens many times is that when we are breaking the stories, we can break the stories to something that is too small for them to deliver enough value. Yeah. So if if in order to make the stories small enough to fit comfortably in the sprint, in whatever whatever thing you're using, yeah. is yeah. they become so small that they don't deliver value, and then you have to rejoin a few of them together. Yeah. Probably you've gone too small, and actually your 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 sprint is too short as well. Yeah. So we're not. So we're actually using flow as opposed to sprints. Yeah. Um, the reason why we went for two weeks, obviously, the, we're just thinking about uh, having enough data points to be able to then use Monte Carlo, because we're thinking yeah. the larger the feedback loops will reduce the number of data points, and we potentially wouldn't have enough data to then actually effectively forecast of course you're going to have that sort of data over a period of time but it's going to take a lot longer to get to that yeah. period of time you've got sufficient data points so that's by doing uh, by doing items of work a week or less meant that we're going to accrue those data points far quicker yeah. but it meant that we weren't actually having pieces of work that could be released by themselves and delivering value and that's the thing sentence by, by then by those pieces were being not not you couldn't release so it, it becomes a, it be, to me, it's a saying that it's gone too far. I mean, this is something that I really learned, really, really interesting. Oh God, it's a bit of a detour. This whole talk again. Um, you know the the, the invest acronym mm -hmm. that we have for for, for good user stories. Yep. Um, yep. In the invest acronym, there is actually a um, um, there is a conflict in that acronym. Invest is um, independent, negotiable, valuable, estimatable small enough and testable, okay? Now, the teams will normally want to make things as small as possible because we got feedback loops, because it's less uncertainty, all those things. The customer or stakeholders want things which have more value. So you have two opposite needs. One, it's like make it bigger with more value and the other one, make it smaller with more certainty for delivery. And the role of a product owner is that broker. It's almost like the magician that gets all these people to to agree. It's a very difficult role, yeah, because effectively you are you are you are actually balancing opposing needs. Yeah. So if if things go too small and there is no value, then you have to recombine them to deliver enough value. Otherwise, the shareholder, the stakeholders are going to say, "Don't want it," or the customers are going to say, "Don't want this. Not, not good enough." Um, so I will try to not make them too small. Keep, keep them to small enough with enough value. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But right. it does a super difficult art. That's that's the art of product product management. Um, and you know, full respect to people that do that awesomely. Okay. So I'll, I'll just read out um, Esther's question in chat. Yes. Um, how would you go about introducing this on a project that is just kick just starting? So I'm assuming by this agile agile metrics. It goes yes. about to kick off a new project and everyone is used to SPs, CT and TPR historical data. 
yeah. is why you start before you have those. What do you use? Okay, so this is a. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, I'm gonna ask you. Okay, typical fear. Typical fear is like what what if I don't have data? Yeah, um, and again, this is one fear that I used to have until someone a guy called uh, ooh, Chris Beckson. No, it's not Chris Beckson. I forgot his, uh, his first name. No, Beckson. Anyway, um, he told me. Um, Jose, no data is already data. So get data then. If you have no data, that's that's already a data point. Get more data. Yeah. Um, the question that I will ask you is like, how many data points do you think you need to be able to do flow metrics? Can I invite you to put it on chat? I want to just see what sort of range. How many data? So how many PBIs? How many stories? Or how many tickets do we need to be able to do estimation? And I'm seeing one, ten, fewer than you think. As a, that, that's a that's a consultant. Someone said if someone says it depends, that's the consultant. Someone says eight, ten to twenty, and it depends. Good one, Harun. Okay, so many times we think that we need to get lots of data. No, we don't need lots of data. Yeah, with just 10 data points, 11, reality, you, are, you already have sufficiently sufficient amount of data to trust the results that you're getting. Yeah. Um, things like actionable agile for metrics, awesome tool. Um, it starts giving you metrics after 10 data points. Okay. So if you don't have any data, and you're doing cycle time estimation, so you're doing single item estimation, you only need to finish 10 items to have data, enough data. Now, the more you have, you may have more precision, but also careful because the more you have, you have data that may be too old and is no longer representative. So I try to take, I have rules for metrics, yeah? I, I rather have recent metrics, recent data than old data. And I rather have representative data than and representative, uh, representative data. Okay, so ten data points. If you're doing, if you're trying to estimate for projects, which I think is, was the question from Star, um, you need ten data points. So if your unit of time is days, you need to get the throughput of the, of ten days. After ten days, you have enough data to do Monte Carlo. Cool. So you only need ten data points to do that. If you need to do some estimation before that, what you can do is try to do a, some, some data which might be more or less historical. You know that might not be representative, maybe it's another team or another project that has been done before. Um, you know that the data is not, is not truly representative of this context, but it may be good enough, so assume that it's good enough to use it for now. But as long as you get the first data point, start throwing the old data away so you might use other projects other teams your previous story from a different company to start it if you need to yeah but you know that that's not good enough so you will throw it away as soon as you can cool okay so we have a question here from christian as well um can you talk more about techniques used to write size stories uh... <laughs> not today <laughs> Um, I, I will point you. I, I, I will, will try to point you to some some converse, some things about right sizing. The the um, the typical thing I, you, you you will use the metrics a little bit more, yeah. But is the, the typical thing for me is that you may use things like um, histograms and your scatter plots to look at what might be the right size that you're trying to aim for, yeah. Within within your it, it's, it's actually a bit of complexity. So you, you, you will know typically how long it takes you to do things with a certain, um, with a certain confidence. Yeah. And then you, you will, you will use metrics to actually say, okay, how small should the normal ones or the, the typical ones be? Yeah. So you start profiling and things like that. Um, I will recommend that, uh, for example, um, Drunk Agile, um, uh, it's a podcast, um, Dan Bacanti and Pratik Singh. You can find it in you can find it in YouTube. Um, we'll put the link to it. It has one episode about right sizing, which is which is very good to to look at it. 
Um, so look at um, Pratik Singh and, and Dan Bakanti that talk. Um, Julia has talked about right sizing, I think, in Julia Wester, um, who is another Kanban trainer. And, and she has done uh, one of her talks here in, in Linaja, London, talked about right sizing as well. So there will be things like that to, to follow up. Yeah, it's a bit too complex to, to do it quickly. That, as a technique, I can explain it a little bit, but it's too complex to, to go over it. Sorry about that. I hope that's okay. Yeah, okay. So next question is from Roberto. Um, have you had experience with teams that use a conversion table between story points and hours? Do you consider that a correlation as we relate points to time or an anti-pattern as we are tended to think in hours instead of just using a comparison? Uh, story points and hours, if they're doing that comparison in terms of seeing whether there is, there is correlation, that might be okay. I will ask, I will check if the hours is your natural unit of time of, of the time that you should you use. Yeah. If you're in a context which is really, really fast paced and you communicate how long things will take in hours, then that's fine. Yeah. Um, for many of the kind of teams that we work, the natural unit tends to be days. But but if in your context hours is good, that's absolutely fine. Um, but it would be a very, very, very fast paced environment. Yeah. Um, if you're doing this kind of things, for example, add something much bigger. So I'm going into the concepts of flight levels. If you're looking at things like programs, portfolios, um, strategic themes, initiatives, then the natural size of those things might be communicated in days. The strategies might be communicated in months or quarters. Yeah. So the unit of time that you choose has to be useful communication tool for because you need to keep it consistent across your environment. You you shouldn't be using hours here, days there, a month there, um, unless you're you different really do doing different types of work. Yeah. So, but yeah, if you have a comparison that is using story points and um, hours the way I was doing, that that might be absolutely fine. Just to check that it correlates. And is that the question, Roberto? And how I answer your question? Yeah, we got a thumbs up. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you. That's it. Okay. Okay. Anyone else want to ask a question? One final question. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. While you're waiting, I'll mention that the recordings um, for this session will be on our YouTube channel. Um, I'll post the link. I'll just quickly post it again. Um, I'll also add that if you want to learn more about this topic, learn more about Agile metrics for projectability, Jose is teaching a course next month. Um, I'll post a link for that as well. Um, awesome course, and you're more than welcome to contact and connect with Jose or myself um, through LinkedIn or through Meetup as well if you want to just have a chat or have any follow up questions. Okay. And um, yeah, our next session is actually tomorrow. Um, it's actually a. <laughs> yeah. Can done discussion group. So you could actually take this conversation there as well uh, if you wanted to. But that's open to everyone. And that's tomorrow at a later time or 7 30 p.m. Um, UK time, that is. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, that study group is, I've, I've done one before. It's going to be um, it's, it's in partnership with another group. And I've attended their, 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 their study groups. And it was a, a great conversation in small groups about. Um, Kanban, metrics, pro Kanban, flow management, all those things. So it's it's a bit of it's, it's, it's a, if you like to geek out in conversations about things, it, it was a really really great experience. So um, I I encourage you, and I will be there. Okay. I'll just post a link for that one as well. Actually. Okay. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Okay. I think we're we're pretty much done. All right. Awesome. Thank you everyone for your attendance. I hope you enjoyed the session. Um, watch out for the video, it should be posted soon. Some of you may see you tomorrow, but until then, yeah, take care and thanks. Good evening. Thank you, everyone. Um, we'll stop the recording um, and then um, thanks, everyone. But, you know, we may stay here for a few minutes if you want to.